Hello again there, neighbors and naysayers. This is Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk for September the 24th, 2020. This month, we went up to the big farm in Carroll County. For those of you that don't know Kendall, Kendall is the president of our Eastern Ohio Grazing Council, and uh, he offered to let us come up and ride around with him for a couple hours and take some video and uh, take a look at what he's doing this year uh, as far as grazing goes. And Talk with him about his operation. So let's get started. First, we'll give you a little background on the Bick operation. Uh, Kendall's father and mother bought the farm in 1956 and comprises of 75 acres, about 40 acres in pasture, the balance in woods, and uh, they now rent 10 acres from the neighbor that they also use as pasture. And Kendall calls that an integral part of their rotation at this point because it helps them complete the circle around the operation. Uh, Kendall took over operations there in 2004. Uh, he managed the farm uh, along with his brother. He said he couldn't do it without his brother's help, his brother Kim and um, <clears throat> Kendall's wife Robin. Kim's wife Janice uh, help out around the farm. And uh, if you've ever been to Kendall's place, it, it, it is always ready for a pasture walk. I told him when we got there, we could hold a pasture walk there today. And so often we go out with uh, with farmers and ask them about having a pasture walk. They say, well, boy, we got to get ready. We got to do this. We got to do that. And Kendall's is one of the many operations we go to that we could show up there at uh, 6.55 and have a pasture walk at 7 o'clock. Uh, they have 25 Angus cows and a couple unique things about the cow herd, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, but uh, they, they're fall calving cows, so they have calves right now. Uh, and also in, in in the cattle world, we don't talk about this often. We do in the hog world, but uh, they're they're pretty much cow to finish as far as their operation goes. Uh, almost every calf or every calf that's born on their operation ends up being finished there at their operation. We'll talk about that. Um, after that, Kendall Kendall's been participating in a lot of our programs and and done some things on his own still with with our planning and with our engineering uh, fences and pressurized water gravity water spring developments stream crossings access points heavy use pads we'll get to all that as this video progresses of course you know they, they rotationally graze or use management intensive grazing and and then also uh they they've got those forestry acres and they've done some forest management practices on them as well so we'll talk about that here in a few minutes here at Kendall's, he is a fall calver, so all of his calves uh, come in the fall, or he said he just finished up here today or yesterday, and this area is where he brings the cows once they calve. So they calve on the heavy use pad just down the road here, and we'll get some pictures of that, but and then they all get turned out into this field. And this field has been left to sort of stockpile. Now, when we usually talk about stockpile, we talk about that for winter feed, but Kendall says he rotates through this once or twice and then lets it grow up. So it is, it is big and mature, but it, there's enough forage here to get him through calving. Now, that's, that sounds like a long time for most of us, but Kendall also AIs all of his cows. So he just told me he had 17 calves born in 10 days. So they don't have to be here as long as most of us think. For most of us that are breeding with a bull and breeding for 60 days, we've got a 60, 70, 80 day calving window. He's got a lot shorter calving window, but he can calve on the heavy use pad, then kick them out in this field until they all have calved, and then he can go back to their regularly scheduled rotation once they're done. So he said he's getting ready to do that here in the next day or two. Kind of a unique part of, of Kendall's operation here in the last two years. He said last year they, they artificially inseminated all their cows 24 of them come up red, only one open. And at that point, he said, I, it wasn't worth it going back and, and resinking that one cow and getting, or getting a clean up bull and cleaning that cow up. He said, I just let them go. And he said, it worked out so much better because we're done with calving in, in real short order. Uh, this year was 10 days that they were done. And, and he said, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense for his operation to go back and clean those cows up and breed the ones that didn't breed. Uh, so, all the calves come all at one time and he said there, there's no kind of ragged edge there to calving uh, starting or finishing they, they get them in get them calved and get them out get them done picture here of his replacement heifers as well as the open cows uh, those were the ones that were still out on on real pasture and still rotating through the operation here the day that we were out there 
uh, but all of his replacements are out and raised on pasture. Uh, they're not in as part of the finish program, which we're going to talk about that here in just a second. But uh, this year he had a few uh, extra open cows, but he said it's still for him uh, and his management and the way he does things. It wasn't worth it to go ahead and, and bring those back in and get them bred. He just runs them as open cows, of course, makes a decision on whether that cow's worth keeping open or whether she needs to go to town. Uh, but kind of runs those animals separate of his cows when they're calving. So they were still out on pasture, still rotating, and they will rejoin the herd here now that they're done calving and the cows go back out on pasture. I said one of the unique things about Kendall's operation, or his family's operation there, is that they finish all of their calves. So uh, every calf that's born on the farm, Kendall says, and then some, we, could, we can even buy some. Uh, to put in with what we raise here ourselves and finish them out and then sells them directly to a customer. Now they're sold as holes, halves, or quarters directly to a customer. So basically box beef, they, they, they can sell them a whole box. Uh, they don't have to worry about going to farmer's markets or selling it piece by piece. It all gets sold to a customer directly. So kind of kind of interesting that he, he goes full circle from calving from conception to consumption is what I say a lot of times to my customers. Uh, it is a grain feeding program, so the calves are, are born there, born on pasture, go to weaning, and then he brings them into the building and uh, feeds grain and some forage uh, to get those steers done. And he says, I, I can have a steer heifer done in about 13 months, which is really pushing it. Now that's, that's getting through them uh, and still have around a 1,300 pound animal. And, and Kendall's got a, a fabulous working facility there at his place. It's it's inside a building, and he keeps track of weights and, and how much they're growing and how and how heavy they are when they go to to slaughter and all those things. And and he takes care of the arrangements through a uh, processor to be able to get them processed. So really, a kind of a cool way to to direct market your product. And as we were there and talked to to Kendall, he said, you know, this makes so much more sense for me than having calves and loading them up and taking them to the sale barn. I can get these all sold and it's a whole lot more economical for my operation. For those of you that don't know, this is a concrete heavy use pad that Kendall put in. Uh, and this serves two purposes really for him. He, he uses it to winter feed, of course. Um, for That's the biggest purpose we would put these in. But again, because he fall calves, he, he brings the ca cows in before they calve, and then they calve here in this heavy use pad and lot area. Uh, so he can keep a close eye on them. They don't get far away. And it's easy to come out here and check. He just said it's easy for anybody to come out here and be able to say, okay, this cow's calving, this cow isn't calving. And then he says he, he uses this heavy use pad again in the fall, uh, starts out the winter feeding hay here until it's time for to preg check and make sure everybody or see who is bred, who isn't bred, and then they can turn them back out and unroll hay out on the fields. Uh, but this gives them a good place to bring them in and get them fed. Kind of giving you the whole view of the heavy use pad area there, and then Kendall's kind of got the push off or push against their kind of wall in the back. Uh, that's kind of a nice feature to add to a heavy use pad. Kendall's pads concrete, um, probably because he likes to keep it a lot cleaner than a lot of folks do that get away with a gravel pad. Uh, and then he does have a gravel pad out here close to the foreground of the picture. Uh, that's just around that water trough, the, the energy-free, frost-free water trough, uh, pressurized off the well to be able to, to put water to those cows in the wintertime, making sure they always have water. Of course, it's sitting on a concrete pad, but there is gravel between that concrete pad and the heavy use pad. Um, but a good view of the heavy use pad. Kendall does have a lot around the outside. Uh, he's got stone on the edges with some geotextile fabric because that's kind of where the mud moves to. Once you have a heavy use pad, it's the edges that then start to get muddy if you allow them on and off the pad. We see producers that get by with a system like this uh, where they've got kind of a bank above the heavy use pad for the cows to kind of get off and, and find somewhere that's a little drier. Uh, but then we also have producers that are, are fencing their heavy use pads in and keep them kind of locked on that. We've got producers that are, are putting in sort of mound type systems, but Kendall's got kind of a natural sort of mound going on there with that bank above that heavy use pad. And that's probably a, a real important feature to it. Of course, he's got an all weather road too that comes out to this heavy use pad from the barn that the, the hay is stored in. So 
they, they don't have any mud to really deal with as far as tractors and, and people movement goes to be able to get animals fed in the winter time and, and in that summer period when he's feeding hay as well uh, as he's calving. Talk just a minute here on the water system. I know we touched on the pressurized water there on the heavy use pad. Uh, Kendall uses kind of a mix of water systems as we go along, you'll see. Uh, but he said this is a real important part of the pastures uh, in this area specifically because they've got this trough split in two. They've got another trough down over the hill a little ways and they can split off of it with temporary fence as need be. But this is a, a, a spring development to a heavy equipment tire tank. Uh, it's got a gravel pad all the way around it so we don't get mud, we don't get bare ground right around the trough, uh, but flows good water all the time. Kendall said actually they last two years it's been so wet that they've got a little extra seat kind of popping up up on the hillside and to get in and take care of, get it cleaned up, dried up, and, and direct it into the pipe. And the next picture will be uh, the spring, the trough on down below it. We'll talk about that then. But if you're interested in a spring development or a gravity flow trough of some kind, or even a pressurized system, we can put these heavy equipment tires in with concrete in the bottom of them, gravel around the outside. They're really durable, they'll last forever. Uh, we have to sometimes protect them to keep the cows from getting to the overflow and inflow pipes. That does happen from time to time, but a really durable kind of permanent water source if that's what we need out in our pasture fields. Now from that last picture, this is the second trough in that chain. So uh, one of the cool things about gravity flow water is if we get one, a spring up high enough or a, a water system up high enough, we can gravity flow that water from trough to trough to trough. And, and we've got systems that got up to seven different troughs in that system from one to another to another. Uh, this one here just particularly just has two. Um, but it's because you kind of run out of elevation, you run out of pasture field by the time you can get that second trough in. But uh, just just so you know, if we do develop, and that's why farmers typically like to develop springs. Their gravity, I had one farmer tell me they're goof proof and simple, and, and that's why we like spring developments. The thing with springs is you can wrap a lot of money up in, in doing a spring development. If you've got a wet area in a field and it needs dried up, and it'll help you manage the pasture better. They're great. If you need a reliable water source on the farm, I tell farmers, you know, that I go out and look at and they've got seven or eight springs that they're looking at. I say, you know, let's pick out the best one. So we've got reliable water from that one. It'll be easier than to put water where we want it with pressurized water. But if we get that one reliable spring development so that if we have a power outage or a, a, a drought period, we know we still have water from that one spring. Uh, it's very viable, and as time goes by, and I think Kendall would echo this, that it, it, it becomes important to have a water system that's not solely based off of one um, kind of place. So if his whole operation were based off the well or based off the creek or based off this one spring development, it wouldn't work so well. But having several different water sources allows his operation to work a lot better. And, and I find that with other producers I work with, they say, you know, it's great to have water off the well, but it's great to have a spring and it's great to have a stream to be able to go to as well, just in case something goes wrong with one or the other source. Standing here looking at Kendall's stream crossing, and this is one of kind of two. He has another one on the farm, but um, this is kind of a unique stream crossing, I guess. He, he's got a, a culvert down below in Bethel Pan there eventually, but um, and then the uh, access, what we call an access point that the cows can access into the stream. So uh, it's kind of an over under deal here where the cows can access the stream and drink from it, and then he can still drive over top of it without having to drive through the water. Uh, I think so often um, folks are reluctant to have us out and, and look at the farm. They're using streams for water and they think that we're going to uh, force them to, to fence the cattle out of the stream completely. And, and in this case, it kind of shows that we're using the stream as a water point. Uh, Kendall says there's eight acres on this field and this is their only water. It's too far from the well and there's no real spring out here to develop. And he just put this access point slash stream crossing in to be able to, to water the cattle here. Um, and he can split this field, I'm sure in two or more because of the stream crossing. But just to show that, that we do 
use streams for water points. We just try to do them in a controlled sort of way. We, we put fabric and stone down and allow them access to it. And you notice that there's no mud here. There's no manure spot left here uh, from the cows standing here and, and shading up in this stream. They shade up other places, go other places, but we've, we've, Kendall's made it a great water access point to be able to use the stream efficiently and, and not muddy it up, not make it dirtier uh, than when it enters the property and it's not dirty when it leaves the property or leaves this area. One or two more thoughts here on the stream crossing as we got done talking. Kendall said, you know, I never noticed that there, there's no manure around the stream crossing. And the cows were currently in this field. The heifers and the open cows were in this field. But there, there's no manure around that crossing. And, and he kind of looked at me, maybe a little puzzled that I had mentioned that. But part of that is because the rock is of varying sizes. There's some bigger stone at the surface. And cows will walk down there and get a drink, but they don't want to hang out there. They walk down there to get a drink and then get out. And he's got other shaded areas around the field, so they'll go there to shade. But he says, you know, I never see them hang out here at this water source. So they're they're coming in and drinking and getting out back out. And it's partially because of that varying rock size. It's not comfortable for them to stand around on. It's comfortable enough to, to get in there and get a drink, but that's about it. And and that's kind of a, a hard part about stream access points or pond access points. We need to get big enough stone in there that it's not comfortable for them to hang out there. But we have to put small stone with it to choke those stones off because we don't want to make it too uncomfortable. We want, do want to make sure that the cows do get there to water and get the quantity of water that they need. The other interesting part is Kendall said he had a regular fence in there to start with and decided to change it up and put wood fence in there along that creek. Uh, it, for one thing, it would be easier if they ever get a flooding event and it takes that, that board fence out. That's a whole lot easier to replace than some other fencing materials. If we put high tensile and tie it to that corner post, it would break the corner post off. But he said the interesting part is because that, those boards are open and wide, he said the cows will actually come up there and drink through the fencing to the creek on the uphill side. They'll drink the cleaner water as it's coming down. So they kind of line up along that fence. And, and I thought that was so cool to think about. We, we never think about that with stream crossings, but this might be something we implement in some of our new access point type drawings for streams is this wooden fence allows those cows to drink upstream from the herd, so to speak. So they they make sure they don't get any dirty water. They don't get the water that they're standing in. Uh, but a good stream access point allows the cattle to get water, but also keeps them from standing around, hanging around in that street. As we were walking around the water system, I had Beth stop and take this picture here of the fence. One of the unique things about Kendall's place uh, is almost all of his fencing, the hot wire, uh, goes through claw insulators. And the same can be done kind of with the pin lock insulators as well, but it's all attached to the post with a claw insulator. And, and I, I'd like to take credit for this. I think it's partially a direct result of one of our grazing meetings. Years ago, we had a, a gentleman come in and talk about electric fence. And I still remember this day, he, he said, it's like drilling a hole in a rubber ball and shooting it down that wire. That's what the electric current looks like when it's going through. And if we run that through a tube insulator, we're taking the outside of that ball off every time. Where if you put it through a claw insulator or a pin lock, it's got a whole lot more room for that electric current to go through. Now, I've got all line insulators at my place. I haven't changed them, but I do think about it. And, and the ease of changing these claw insulators is a whole lot easier than changing an uh, inline tube type insulator. And, and you know, if, if Kendall wants to drop the fence in any place, it takes a, a drill with a screw head on it to be able to take those insulators off, loosen the fence and drop it and be able to go over it wherever he needs to. I don't know that he necessarily built it for that, but that is a one good point about having those pin lock insulators. But they say you will find you'll have better electric current with the bigger type insulator where that electric current can go through a lot easier. But real unique part about Kendall's place, other than that, his interior fences typically are three strand. That bottom wire is, is really high up. But Kendall has a, a special mower that he can mow along the fence. It, it, as you hit the post, it moves the mower head out of the way and then comes back on a spring uh, to mow underneath the fence. They mow once or twice a year underneath those fences. 
And then the outside fences, the exterior fences, are either four or five strand high tensile. They got a wire a little closer to the ground. Still, they can mow under it, but they got a harder type fence uh, on the outsides, and then just this three strand interior fence. And uh, they, if the wire is even high enough, he says the calves can go under it if they choose. It's not really a big deal. They're creep grazing anyway. Um, but a, a good way to keep fences managed, keep them mowed. He said, you know, we don't have to spray our fence rows because we got that mower that we can mow. We do spray some, he says, but for the most part, they can mow those fences because the wire is up high and they're able to get around all of their fences on both sides. I mentioned that Kendall's done some forestry practices. Uh, the last pasture walk we had there was in 2016, and we actually did some walking down into the, the woods and, and looking around. And we talked about the stream crossing and how you know, we didn't make him fence off the stream wholesale. They they did fence off most of the streams and they've got areas that the stream is fenced and they can use it as pasture and they do use it as pasture a couple times a year, but it's it's not fenced in such a way that the cows always have access to the stream. But just a, a good point, Kendall has managed the forestry outside of the pasture. Uh, Kendall's brothers uh, involved in the forestry industry and so I'm sure the forest part of it is, is important to their family and and, and it's just a, a good point to make. So often when we're there for grazing, we're talking about the grazing animals and the livestock and the grass and all those other things. But here in East Ohio, we've got a lot of opportunities with forestry and with forest products. And so many of our operations have a large amount of their acres tied up in forest. And and to be honest, if we really look at the, the economies of, of forestry, a lot of times we can make as much money in our forests as we can on our pasture fields. Now we all like cows or we like sheep um, and that's what we really want to do on our operation. Forestry a lot of times to us isn't all that interesting but it, it is an economical use of our land and, and so we have to see it as such and we have to manage those forest areas in such a way that they're going to return to our operation. I think Kendall and his family have done a good job of doing that. We're just up above his stream crossing, and this is a field that has been cut over, rec reclaimed back from timber. Uh, Kendall said somewhere in the 60s, but of course it's the furthest field away from the barns, and so it got almost no fertility for all those years. And he said just about three years ago they decided that they were going to unroll hay back here and try to improve the fertility of this field. And I think if, if you're looking at it on the video, you can tell that it has really had a marked effect on the field by unrolling back here in this field uh, really the fertility is is looking really good the forage is looking really good you can tell that a couple or at least I can tell that a couple of years ago it wasn't so great and, and it's getting better it's improving over time but a good field to feed hay in the winter time east south facing drier droughtier sort of soils and with a good water source to be able to, to bring cows up and, and I commented to Kendall um, he hauls hay back here every day to feed cows and, and their roads look good they're in good shape and that that takes maintenance um, they've got some hard roads here and there but for some of it's trekking through the field and so they've done some some repair jobs I'm sure uh, where they've made a mud uh, coming in and out with the tractor but it just takes maintenance it takes getting back out there and, and fixing those up and that's one of the complaints we have about feeding hay out in the field is we make a mess we make a mess with the tractor and, and it just takes maintenance it takes knowing that we're going to come back and fix those areas spread some seed and get some things growing but a really good example of a field that they unroll hay on for the last three years they've run unrolled hay in here january february and then he said that you know when it starts getting muddy they can work their way back to the heavy use pad. They've got that option to be able to take them to it. And now they've expanded and started unrolling in the fields closer to the barns, uh, the next field back from here, because again, it, it didn't get the fertility that those fields closest to the barn have gotten historically over the, the last several years. So a really good example of a field that we can unroll hay on. It's far from the barn, uh, but good east facing dry soils to be able to keep the cows from getting muddy and to add fertility to the field. I'll tell a quick story here on Kendall as we were out there uh, looking at this field. I asked, I said, so do you have a bale on roller or do you just stack them right there and push them down the slope? So we got a bale on roller. He says, well, we were going to these meetings and talking about winter feeding and, and we got to talking about bale on rollers and 
and we didn't know. We just took the bale out. We decided we were going to unroll bales. He said, it took us a couple hours to get two bales unrolled by hand. And we quickly decided we need to do something different. This wasn't going to work for us. And he said, as a part of organizations like this, like the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council and other organizations that they belong to, farming organizations, uh, Kendall had a, a, a number of people he could get in touch with and say, hey, why didn't this work? And he said he had called one farmer in particular and said, well, you need a bale unroller. And he said, you know, I'd, I'd never heard of th such a thing. Didn't even know there was such a thing out there. And so uh, he said, as luck would have it, this farmer had a bale unroller that he wasn't using at the time. And he was able to go pick it up, bring it back and, and use it. And he said, it only took us a couple of times using that to decide we needed a bale unroller too. So they actually use a bale unroller on this field. Uh, to be able to put the hay where they want to. And I, I kind of joked with him that it's kind of the reverse of haymaking, uh, where haymaking, we're going around in, in a pattern and mowing the field. When they unroll hay, they're kind of going around the pattern and unrolling hay on the field to make sure they get it completely covered. So kind of an interesting way to think about it. We harvest hay in one way and we put it back in another way. Um, but a good way Hey, Fed, the other part about Kendall's operation is I, I, I just assumed, and this goes to show you never should do that. I said, so I assume you got a four-wheel drive tractor that you come all the way out here. Because if you can't tell from the pictures, there's some steep areas on Kendall's place. And he said, no, we do it all with a two-wheel drive tractor. And, and as we sit there and talk, I thought, you know, that's probably why, he, one of the reasons why he, he's able to do it and make it look so good this time of year and by the spring and summer months even, because he's got a two-wheel drive tractor. He only goes out there when he can. Now, he, when he's got cows out there to feed, he has to go out there every day because if we're gonna unroll hay, we gotta do it every day. We can't unroll more than one day or else they'll waste it all. But because of going out there in a two-wheel drive tractor, he uh, he's, he's only going the times when he can. When he can't, they pull the cows in and put them on the heavy use pad. Uh, if, if the weather got bad enough that the two-wheel drive tractor couldn't get there, that probably means those cows needed to come in and come to a heavy use pad anyway. And, and and don't take this to mean that I'm poking fun at anyone who doesn't own a four wheel drive tractor. We own one at home. And the reason why I know what I'm, what I've just told you is because too often we take that four wheel drive tractor for granted. We take it out there when we shouldn't, when we don't need to be out there in the field. When we have to click the four wheel drive on to get to the field, it's too muddy to have cattle out there in the field for us. We need to have them in on a heavy use pad. And, and it's funny how we have those um, comforts, those things that, that make our life easier, like a four wheel drive tractor or a cab tractor. Uh, but sometimes they can get us in trouble. And so I just thought it was interesting to point out that, that they're doing this all with a two-wheel drive tractor, be able to unroll those, those bales. And like I said, that probably keeps them from tearing up too much and, for, and, and keeps it looking the way that it does right now instead of tearing things up. A, a tractor will do an immense amount of damage. I, I'll, I'll be the first to say that unrolling hay, you can do more damage with the tractor in one day than the cows can do in one day very easily. So Kendall has made this field look good. I mean, it, 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 you can kind of tell where they've been feeding hay. You can tell that it's recovering, and it's only going to get better. Uh, but a really good job of unrolling hay and, and using what they have there at the farm to make the farm better. One last thing while we're here, and, and Beth kind of panned into a, a, a shot of the forage in that video, but I didn't say it earlier, but when we got out of the truck at Kendall's, I was impressed before we ever said a word to him at the kind and quality of forage that they have for, for this time of year. Part, part of that's because they've had the cows in calving, but you know if they, if they calved in 10 days, it's not like they've been off the pastures that long. Uh, but a very good quality forage for this time of year with the weather that we've had. Uh, I was really impressed with the amount and kind and quality and species diversity out there in his fields and, and what things look like. Uh, that just goes to good management. It goes to meticulous management and under Kendall's uh, care. He, he's really good about keeping after things and making sure they look good. And, and, and I, I marvel at his ability to be able to to keep all those things going and, and the farm really looking so good and, and even down to the forage looking wonderful and, and top notch right now for this time of year. 
Beth took this picture here of Kendall and I standing at the heavy use pad and talking. And I don't normally like to put pictures in there myself, at least uh, in a pasture walk video, but I, I did it for one reason, and, and that's because uh, I I asked Kendall as we do with all of our pasture walk participants if he wanted to be videoed or if he wanted to speak as a part of the video and he made it pretty clear that he he didn't really wasn't really interested in in being on video or talking in the video and uh as we were standing there talking um it was one of those many many times when i'm talking to a producer that i wish we would have just clicked on the voice part and recorded what what he had to say because he had some very um good points about working with uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS, uh, my agency, and, and also Soil and Water Conservation Districts and and uh, doing the work that he's done out there on the farm. Kendall's been a participant in the EQIP program, been a participant in the CSP program, and uh, he, he, he had some really good things to say about those programs. But, but he said also, it, it doesn't really matter whether you receive cost incentive money or not. It, it just makes sense to him to work with uh, our agencies uh, to, to be able to do these improvements uh, just from our technical expertise. And that kind of made me smile because as an NRCS employee, that, that's kind of our thing is the technical expertise. Uh, we, we lend those technical standards uh, to farmers uh, to be able to get things built. And we were standing there next to that water trough and he said, you know, I, I would have never known how to do this. And even if I had did, done it on my own, I wouldn't have done it right. I wouldn't have done it to last. I wouldn't have done it so that it would still be here. And he said, I've had zero maintenance on this thing since I put it in. And and that's a, an important part, he said, to a farmer, because we don't have time to do it again. We, we want to do it and do it right the first time and get it done. And he said, you know, I'd encourage any producer to get hooked up with their NRCS office or soil and water office. And, and like he said, even if you're not looking for incentive dollars, uh, just for the technical ability, the technical know-how of how to, to get some of these things installed and get them installed right so that they last for the operation so that they can go on and do other things and, and think of other things. And, you know, we even look at this from, a, from an economic perspective. It's a whole lot cheaper to do it right the first time than it is to do it wrong the first time and have to do it right the second time or the third time. Uh, one of the old technicians I used to work with used to say uh, to, to producers that you didn't have the time or the money to do it right the first time, but you somehow found the time and the money to do it right the second time. But what we want to do is, is do it right the first time. And uh, I, I'll, I'll shout out to the, Kevin uh, Swope. He's located in Carroll County, um, and, and that's where Kendall's farm is, and, and you've got no better um, ambassador for what NRCS and Soil and Water does than, than Kendall Bick, as far as uh, saying what the program meant to him and, and what our technical ability meant to him. Well, that's a wrap for this month's Pasture Walk. We thank you all for tuning in, and be looking ahead here in the next week or two. Uh, we're going to do another update um, based on dealing with grazing after the drought and things that we're seeing after the dry period we experienced and how to manage through that and transition into winter feeding which is going to be upon us here before we'd like to admit it so with that i'll say we'll see you next time